to you. I would love to hand over. And this is Carol. Nice to see you, Carol. Let me just give her a quick introduction. Carol has 30 years of experience in ELT. That's, that's a substantial amount of experience. And she's been a teacher, a teacher trainer, an academic manager, a materials writer, and an educational consultant. Um, her specialization is in early years uh, and primary English language education. Um, just very quickly, in the chat field, how many of you teach young learners? And if you do, just very quickly, what age of young learners do you teach in the chat field? Very quickly, so Carol has a quick idea. Um, you might recognize some of Carol's publications, like 500 Activities in the Primary Classroom and Tiger Time. Um, her latest publication is a new global preschool course called Mimi's Wheel by Macmillan. I've seen it. It's colorful. It's wonderful. It's very user friendly. Um, and Carol is here today to talk about young learners and how we can survive and thrive as a language teacher of young learner classrooms. So over to you, Carol. OK, thank you very much, Shia. And hello, everybody. Welcome to this wonderful um, event. It's great to see so many of you here. And today, I'm talking to you about how to survive and thrive as a language um, teacher of children. And of course, surviving is to do with getting through, with coping, with hanging on in there without giving up. And thriving is to do with, it's to do with loving what you do and feeling it's worthwhile. And in this webinar, we'll be looking at both. I've realized that often in my own teaching and in talks that I give to Because essentially, if we feel good about our, let's face it also, that whatever anyone says, teaching children can be extremely stressful and exhausting. So I'd just like to ask you, what do you think makes teaching stressful and exhausting. Would you like to put some of your ideas in the chat box, please? What makes teaching children stressful and exhausting in your finding new material? Absolutely. More ideas. OK. Unexpected reactions. Apps, parents. Yes. Yeah. Lot of energy, overexcited manner. Yeah, their behavior. They're very active. Lack of learning experience, lack of discipline. You need a lot of energy, variety, fantastic ideas. They get bored easily. Yeah, yeah, all these things. I absolutely agree with you that these make it enough energy, not enough activities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, um, I really think we're all on the same page here. And um, actually, here are some possible reasons, and some of them have come up already. So to start off with, of course, challenging behavior. And this is a reality when we have large classes, or even if we don't have large classes, that the behavior of children can at times be very challenging. We often have unrealistic expectations from parents, from the institution. Sometimes think if your children start learning at six, why aren't they ready to do the first certificate by the age of 12? Well, actually, as we know, children's learning doesn't necessarily work like that. There's also pressure on us to reach attainment targets and to pass exams. And we live in an increasingly test-based culture. Often, we have limited space. We have small classrooms where there's no room to move. We also often have limited resources and narrow curriculum a course book that perhaps you're not wild about. 
And many of us also feel, have feelings of inadequacy in dealing with the very different ability levels that we have in our classes, and also dealing with any kind of special needs or mental health problems that we may have among our children too. And the other thing, of course, is the long hours, um, the traveling to classes, you know, teachers I know who do peripatetic and they're teaching in different schools, the traveling takes a long time. And of course, there's an awful lot of preparation and market, marking to do as well. So we need to find practical ways to keep upbeat about our jobs and to avoid burnout if we're really going to sustain our enthusiasm and commitment over time and positively influence the children that we teach. And actually, as the um, traditional saying goes, to care for the teacher is to love the learner. The implication of this being that if we look after ourselves, there are hugely positive implications for the children too. I actually, as part of my work, part of my writing, part of consultancies that I do, I observe a lot of teaching in classrooms all over the world, maybe not in some of your countries, but in many of them, yes. And I sometimes, when I'm in class, I think to myself, actually, who's doing all the work here? Because very often, it seems to be the teachers who are explaining, demonstrating, controlling behavior, managing the class, getting a sore throat from talking too much and too loudly. And children sometimes seem to be actually sitting back and observing a performance or spectacle. And there's something a little bit wrong with that, because actually in lessons, it's the children who should be engaged in doing a lot of the work too. And what I'd like to look at, first of all, in this webinar, is six examples of survival strategies to help you conserve your energy and to get through the day without expending so much energy that you're completely exhausted in a way that perhaps the children aren't. So let's have a look at those six strategies now. These are strategies, as I say, that I've learned from my own teaching experience and also from visiting a lot of classes and a lot of lessons um, around the world. And the first strategy, the first survival strategy is look after your voice. It's not rocket science, but your voice is your most precious possession. It is liquid gold. If you don't have your voice, you really can't teach. And just some very um, straightforward common sense tips to bear in mind. Don't speak too loud. The easiest way to wreck your voice, and if you speak loudly, the children will too, and that raises the volume continuously in the classroom. And actually, if you speak at a level so that the children also have to be quiet to hear what you're saying, it's um, far more effective also from a classroom management point of view. The second thing, to actually find your natural pitch when speaking. Often we speak lower to convey authority. Will you stop doing that? And higher to, ex to express friendliness. Wow, that's a really lovely picture. But both can harm your voice. So try and find your natural pitch and not vary from it too much. Stay hydrated, drink lots of water, much better than coffee. And actually, if you have a problem with your voice, you might like to try doing what are called vocal straw exercises. I was taught these years ago 
actually when I did a lot of acting, not teaching. And they may seem a bit daft, but they do actually help. What you do is you have a straw and you sort of hum with your vocal cords into your into the straw. You go sort of you can are in front of your computer and use them to warm up voice and your vocal cords. And they also help with voice fatigue. So that's tip number one. Let's look at the next tip. The next survival strategy, make the most of your routines. Routine, we use opening routines, for example, the way we greet the children, we talk about the weather, we take the re register, maybe we have news of the day from individual children, and we may have routines such as doing a lesson review. Now, I was talking there about making the most of routines and all the kinds of routines that we mentioned, opening routines, closing routines, routines for going to the toilet, giving out materials, um, moving around the classroom, story time, etc. Routines are hugely important because they create order and security, they're predictable so everyone knows what to do, they save you giving instructions, they build confidence and create a sense of learning community, they give you more time for teaching and learning because classroom management jobs don't take so long and they also save your voice, which as we've seen earlier, is hugely important as well. So, survival strategy number three, value children's languages. Often when I visit classes around the world, I see teachers spending a huge amount of time and effort trying to insist that children speak English. Of course, this is hugely important, but children are naturally going to speak their mother tongue or the shared classroom language unless you have a clear strategy. And this should be based on encouraging the use of English, but at the same time, making it clear that you value their languages, their other languages. So you need to be consistent in the classroom language you use. For example, if you say, everybody quiet now, please, and looking this way, thank you. Don't then say something like, please stop talking and eyes to the front. Let the children get used to the kind of um, phrase that you've used. You also need to explicitly teach classroom language, for example, through dialogues, role plays, improvisations, based on activities such as cooperative games or looking things up online for a project. It won't just happen by itself. And I think also you need to show that you value children's multilingual identities. Don't fight them or banish them. If you share the children's language, use this as a resort when a, as a resource, sorry, when appropriate. For example, for lesson reviews, or for talking about values, or for recapping on instructions and what to do. Also, when learning new words, it's quite often fun to ask, can anyone else, can anyone tell us what this means in another language? So, value the children's languages, survival strategy number three. Survival strategy number four, play the waiting game. This is just one of many behavior management techniques that you can learn and that will be hugely important in your survival armory. Have an attention signal, a tambourine. I've used a tambourine probably for something like 30 years. A bell, a gesture, standing in a special place. The game, well, it isn't really a game. But what it is, is that you wait for complete quiet before speaking and explaining what to do. Because otherwise you're involved in using your voice, be quiet, sit down, pay attention, and so on. And the secret to the waiting game 
is using neutral body language. Don't sit there, stand there rather, showing your irritation. Just be completely neutral. If I have to wait here all day for you to be quiet, then fine. And actually, what invariably happens is that one child notices that you're waiting and says to the others, shh, she's waiting, and actually do your classroom management for you. This means that you don't have to either raise your voice or explain what to do several times. So that's just one example of behaviour techniques that you can use that will help you to survive and get through those hours of weekly teaching that you have. The next tip, survival strategy five, make mileage out of your materials. Find flexible ways to use the same materials. Here's a little set of picture cards. Let's think of all the different games we could do with them. We could play a memory game. We could play Snap. You may like to suggest some ideas in the chat box. We could play Find a Partner or Find Your Group. We could classify them into transport that goes in the air, on land or in water. We could do odd one out with children thinking up the creative reasons as to why they're the odd one out. Similarly, be creative with your course book. Have activities up your sleeve that you can use with your course book. For example, the illustration in a, on a course book page might be used as the basis for a true-false memory game. Equally, children can write their own questions to answer for others to answer about a story or a text rather than answering the ones in the book. So making mileage out of your materials. And survival strategy number six is find ways to reduce your workload. Often hard, I know, but think of things like marking. Do you really need to collect in the children's work? Could you get the children to peer correct instead? Do you need to correct everything in their work? Or can you not do focused marking? For example, noting on the text that it's corrected for past tense verbs only. Similarly, with your lesson plans, keep a record of them in a place where you can find them again and reuse them with any improvements, of course, as a result of your reflective cycle. So those are six survival strategies. But I think, as we all know, surviving doesn't necessarily mean thriving. All of those strategies help you to survive, but thriving is much more intangible and also much harder to achieve. And here are some of the reasons why, and you may like to add others as well. First of all, a lack of work-life balance. I think for teachers, work-life balance is often blurred. We define ourselves through our work. My life is my work, and my work is my life. And perhaps we need to be more, uh, more, more careful in finding that kind of balance. The second thing that we often have find ourselves unable to switch off, that actually we find it difficult to think of other things, to not be in work mode. And we need our own personal space and quality time with our friends and family. And of course, they need us too. Very often, we also feel anxiety about things that we can't control. For example, things like uh, the classroom materials that we may be obliged to use, the timetable that we may not have any choice over. And we often spend time venting or being anxious about the things that are not in our control, when actually we'd be better off to spend the time on our energy on the things that we can control. 
we also often have negative thoughts. I think it's the natural thing to look for the things that aren't going well rather than the things that are. And we often have negative thoughts about ourselves, about our teaching, about the children we teach, about the materials, about the institution, about the parents. When we come out of class, we immediately think of what went wrong, not what went right. And actually, we need to reframe positively. Similarly, I think as teachers, we have a tendency, perhaps not all of us, but many of us, to be perfectionists. We're too demanding of ourselves and feel guilty when not everything goes right. And I also think quite strongly that there's a culture of this in our profession with an emphasis on quality, excellent, outstanding teaching. And we expect, we expect it of ourselves all the time. Well, it's quite hard to be outstanding for 24 hours, 30 hours, 35 hours, however many hours you're teaching a week. I think sometimes we need to be a bit gentler on ourselves and settle for what um, a colleague of mine once called bread and butter teaching, which is totally satisfactory, totally adequate, but not the kind of tiramisu teaching that we might do every now and again. So there's that tendency to be perfectionist. And also, we tend to feel absolutely swamped. Um, but teaching demands, pastoral care demands, never mind um, our own families and the kind of personal demands on that. So teaching is very challenging and it stretches us on a day-to-day -day basis. As to thrive and for our children to thrive, we need to focus on well-being. And well-being should be a goal, both for ourselves and for the children. And my next question to you is obvious enough, I think, but very important. What is well-being? I'm not asking for a definition, but could you put your ideas in the chat box? What is well-being? Can I see some ideas coming through there? Any ideas? What is well-being? Perhaps I can't see the chat. OK, fantastic. Sorry, I was in the wrong chat box. Uh, safe and happy, feeling good, harmony, inner harmony, pleasure. Oh, fantastic. Absolutely satisfied, feeling good, well-balanced. Oh, wonderful. So absolutely wonderful. And it's interesting, actually, that none of you are using the word happy um, because actually it is sometimes equated with um, happiness, but it's actually not about it. And quite often, well-being is divided into subjective well-being, a person's own assessment of how well their life or parts of it um, are going measured by things like their life satisfaction and positive and negative emotions. And people also talk about psychological well-being, people's sense of meaning, purpose and engagement with life, leading to a sense of fulfilment um, in the longer term. And many writers on well-being talk about five areas of well-being, and those are physical, mental, emotional, social, and spiritual. And well-being essentially, it's, a, it's absolutely, you've summed it up in all your comments there, which are absolutely brilliant. Harmony, um, it actually means feeling good, both about yourself and the world around you, and being able to get on with life in a way that you feel satisfied with. And actually, one way of understanding well-being is to look at behavior 
of people who have it. And according to research, intentional activities identified by psychologists that increase and maintain people's level of well-being include things like investing in close relationships, high levels of gratitude, being helpful and altruistic, having an optimistic outlook, living in the moment, uh, doing exercise, and having a clear sense of purpose in life. So let's have a look at why, in an educational context, well-being is important both for teachers and for children. And the first point is that actually, and there is research that shows this, it leads to better academic achievement and performance. Well-being is important for children because there is evidence that children with higher levels of well-being generally perform better at school. And I'm particularly drawing here on Gutmann and Vorhaus's work from 2012, anyone who's interested in that. And of course, it's important for teachers because teachers are a role model for children's well-being. And there's a direct correlation between teachers' well-being and children's achievement. And of course, teachers also have a greater sense of satisfaction and a sense of well-being when the children that they teach improve. The second reason that it's important is that it reduces increasing levels of stress, anxiety and depression. And I don't want to make you all feel depressed now, but actually these days there are more mental health issues such as stress, anxiety and depression among both teachers and children. And these can be combated by better levels of well-being. And just to give you some examples of recent statistics from the UK, but you may also find there are similar, um, similar statistics or similar problems in your country. I'm not going to read these statistics out, but you can see there that these are very recent statistics. The top two refer to children, the bottom two to teachers. And they do show that this is a real, real problem. And in addition to the ones on your screen from the Young Minds research, um, also, 82% of teachers say that the focus of tests and exams has become disproportionate to the overall well-being of children. And 73% of parents would actually prefer to send their children to a school where children are general happy, generally happier, but not necessarily achieving hugely highly. So, the kind of um, the conclusion from that research is that there is too much focus these days on academic attainment and not enough on well-being, which leads to the next point about why it's important. And that is that it's vital for societies and um, individuals um, and should be a goal, the goal of education in its own right that actually that should be the goal of purpose of education, to give children the skills to lead a happy and fulfilled life. That children's well-being at the end of the day is more important than their grades. And with the research I quoted earlier, we've seen that parents also often think this. And your well-being is also more important. And as the old adage goes, schools should prepare children for the tests of life and not a life of tests. So when the importance of well-being is recognised, this also helps to make teaching more meaningful and pleasurable. Because there is actually, as the seasons show, there is a symbiosis and a, an important link and connection between well-being and learning, that they cannot be separating, separated. Children's learning is directly impacted by their own 
and their teachers' well-being, and vice versa. And similarly, there is a symbiosis, if you like, between teachers and children. There is actually a cycle of influence in which teachers and children's feelings are intimately connected. Teacher well-being directly impacts on children's well-being and therefore also on their learning and vice versa. Now, there are many ways to improve well-being and some of the typical ones that you will read about are to do with eating well and healthily, to do with exercise, having enough and of varied types, to do with sleeping well, and again, sleeping enough, to do with drinking lots of water, and also to do with mindfulness, which you have a whole webinar on coming up in just a moment. And so what I thought we would do now is to actually look at four ways to improve well-being, both in relation to ourselves and to children the impact on both ourselves and the children. And the four ways that we're going to look at are these. Building relationships, looking for the positive, challenges and mindsets, and the four R's. So to start off with, what are some of the features of positive relationships? Would you like to just put your ideas in the chat box? What are some of the features of positive relationships? How, how, do, how, do, um, how do you feel when you're in a positive relationship? L listening to each other, empathy, fantastic. Absolutely, yes. Respect, mutual respect and care, fantastic. Okay, so all of these kind of features, I've put up a sort of brainstorm list up, up here. All these are features of positive relationships. And as teachers, we all have our own unique teaching persona. That is the personality and role we adopt in class. So we all build positive relationships in our own unique way. But nevertheless, there are some practical things that we can do, whatever our style, and persona of teaching we have. And first of all, it's to do with modeling social skills. But actually, this is one of the key ways is to model the behavior that we want our children to use. So this may be using please, using thank you, eye contact, smiling, using the children's names. It also includes using humor, maybe in a very simple way, the kind of high five greetings that you give children and making sure that you never use sarcasm or use humor at any child's expense. The next point to do with it, creating an inclusive classroom. This is to do with creating an atmosphere of our classroom, a team spirit, whereby we might do things like create a class contract where we have our rules for our classroom and we use inclusive language. Not, I want you to do this, but let's do this together. We're going to do this. Um, the next point to do with making personal connections. So actually looking to do activities where uh, we make personal connections with the children and they make personal connections with each other. So for example, an activity that you may be familiar with, which I used for years and I like very much, is called Guess the Lie. And you get the children, and you can also do it yourself, to write three little statements about themselves and two of them are true and one is a lie. So they might write something like, I live on a houseboat, I've got a snake, I've got twin sisters. And they then um, exchange and read each other's sentences and find out what's true and um, what's the lie. Or another activity called, or I call it, K 
cat or dog, where you say pairs of words, so cat or dog, indicating one side of the classroom or the other. The children go to the side that they prefer and then explain their choices. So what we're doing is finding things in common and kind of and bonding. Also crucial is finding moments for individual contact. This may be at the beginning of lessons, it may be at the end of lessons, it may be while children are doing individual work. And if you know what they do in their outside life, for example, they go fishing with their dad at the weekend, then actually make a connection with that and ask about it as well. Balancing the kind of praise and criticism. It's always, we're all too good at finding, at looking for what's not going right rather than looking at what is going right and in relationships with children I've read somewhere that we should actually balance about seven or eight praise to one negative and if you think about it if people ever criticize you and praise you you normally remember the criticism and that can make you feel bad make you conform and doesn't necessarily lead to positive relationships. The next thing, to include collective and cooperative activities. By collective activities, I mean things like singing and storytelling, where in the phrase of Van Leer, all the children are intersubjectively engaged. In other words, they're all focused on the same thing. And this is very um, bonding and also to do cooperative activities where children, these may be games or projects, where children have the opp opportunity to practice social skills as well as language skills. And of course, all these things in terms of pos fostering positive relationships, uh, you also need to think of how you can transfer, how these can be useful for you in the staff room. Okay, moving on to the next um, point about how to improve well-being is very simply to do with looking for the positive. I think I've mentioned already that actually as teachers, as people, we tend to look for and focus on the negative. You think of something like a lesson you give and feedback you get and 98% of it will be positive. And the one comment that you remember and focus on will be the one bit of negative feedback that you've got. And well-being is influenced by positive thoughts. And we need to be consciously aware of the positives in our lives and also in what our children are doing too. So we need to look for positives in children's behaviour, not just constantly telling them off for what they've done wrong, which is an easy group to get into. Practice the CBG technique so that they know that you value this as much as their work. Similarly with their work, look out for what's positive in their work, not just for mistakes. And remember the seven, eight to one rule in terms of um, praise. Children, we can also do specific activities. One I like is using sticky notes, and it's called things that went well, three things that went well. And I get children, it might be at the end of a lesson or at the end of a week, um, to actually note three things that went particularly well, and then to put them on a board and to share and exchange their, their ideas. And for you as well, when you come out of a lesson, rather than thinking, oh my God, that was awful, this happened, that happened, that happened, come out, reframe it positively. Rather than coming out and thinking, this was awful, that was awful, what went well? Think of three things that went well. And I'm sure if you try, you'll find them. And it helps to reframe the way you look at the world. Another idea, which is very nice, I think, is the idea of a gratitude book. 
for you, have a little notebook. At the end of the day, note down, or if you don't want to actually commit it to paper, just think in your head of three things that you feel grateful for at the end of every day. And you could get children to do that as well. Or another activity I've seen with children, which is very nice, is getting them to write WhatsApp notes or emails to friends and family to say why they're grateful to them. I'm grateful that you bring me to school every day. It's just thinking in this positive way. By the way, the organizers, I'm a bit behind on my time because of the we we started late and we also had that little upset. Can I just can I go on and finish my talk or are you wanting me to stop? I'll just carry on unless I see any huge red lights. Okay. So moving on to the the third thing I was going to mention, and we'll do this quite um, briefly, is the relationship between challenges and mindsets. Challenges are a bit like the three bears story. They're either too easy, too difficult, or just right. And of course, many of you will know that I'm referencing here in a way, indirectly, the work of Vygotsky and the idea of the zone of proximal development, or put more simply, that we have a comfort zone where we don't have to make much effort, struggle zone where we do, and we have a kind of out of your depth zone. And given the right kind of support, making an effort leads to deep learning and the pleasure and satisfaction of having overcome a challenge. And this relates, of course, to the concept of mindset and fixed and growth mindsets, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with from the work of Professor Carol Dweck at Stanford University. And children who have a fixed mindset have a belief, implicit belief, that their intelligence is a fixed tray. If you like, it is a helpless orientation, that's in her terms. And mistakes make them lose confidence because they attribute errors to a lack of ability which they can do nothing about. So in relation to challenge, they avoid challenges because challenges make mistakes more likely and they don't believe that they can change their intelligence. So they give up before they even try. With a growth mindset, children think that they can achieve things through their own effort and hard work. And children feel over empowered to overcome difficulties and improve. So if the challenge in our lessons is always low, children think they don't have to make an effort to achieve. And if they do, it's, it's, they, they can't because they, they don't believe that they can do it. It's to do with their intelligence. So that can lead to a fixed mindset. If the challenge is out of their depth, this can also lead to a fixed mindset. Children give up and um, barriers go up because they don't feel they have what it takes. So if children have to struggle, but are given the right support and also praised for their efforts, they feel they can do it and they feel they can make the effort and persevere, leading to a growth mindset that they are in charge of their learning. And for us, it's important to get the level of challenge right for individual children. And we can do this by differentiating tasks in different ways. We can actually differentiate the task itself, or we can differentiate the kind of support that we give, more support for some children, or actually by the outcomes, for example, guided writing, as opposed to open-ended writing. And as teachers, we need to think about the level of challenge and mindset for ourselves in relation to our teaching. And whether if we never experiment and take on things, we have a rather fixed mindset to what we're doing, rather than if we experiment 
and trying new things, but not too much, too new, too quickly, and have um, a growth mindset. So moving on then to my last, um, the last point I want to make about um, things we can do to improve well-being of children and ourselves, the four R's. And in this case, the four R's are resilience, resourcefulness, reciprocity, and reflectiveness. And we need to work on developing these in ourselves and in our children to improve well-being. Resilient relates above all to emotions and feelings. It's to do with managing distractions, recognizing and reducing disruptions, persevering and seeing things through, carrying on despite difficulties, taking mistakes in your stride and learning from them. As you'll recognize, it links very directly to the development of a growth mindset that we were just talking about. Being resourceful is more to do with thinking and cognition, to do with questioning, with reasoning, with making connections, with taking initiatives to solve problems. Reciprocal is to do with social interaction. It's to do with our ability and willingness to collaborate with others, to learn from others, to do with balancing our independence in the way we solve problems and do our work, and interdependence, the way we positively rely on other people. And just think of that in a kind of professional or staff room um, context. We're having a lovely um, moment of uh, reciprocity today, for example. And reflective, of course, is to do with managing, managing things and metacognition. So it's to do with planning our learning or our teaching, learning from experience, learning from what happens, understanding yourself as a learner or a teacher. And in the case of children, the four R's involves teaching children the language to talk about what they what they're doing when they're learning. It's very, very empowering um, to actually give them the tools to be able to talk about that. And of course, you can also use the mother tongue or their shared language as well. As teachers, we tend to look at what children are doing wrong. We're telling them off for things they're not doing right all the time. Actually, let's reframe that and look at what they are doing right and acknowledge it. You think of a typical example, a child who never brings their book to class. Oh, oh no, Juan, you haven't brought your book today. Where's your book? So on and so on. Probably what happens, the one day that the child remembers their book, the teacher will say nothing. Okay, so it's really important for us to acknowledge appropriate behavior. And this also shows implicitly to the children how much we value it. And actually, by all the comments in the box earlier about the things that make our lives just behavior is crucial. So we can change that by looking for the positive things. OK, does that answer the question? That's fantastic, Carol. I love that. Catch them being good. I'm going to apply that to my children uh, immediately. Yes, yes. That, that you can you can use it at home as well. It works for parenting too. Absolutely. Yes, it does. I, yeah. I certainly will. Are there any other questions that you might like to ask Carol or something that you missed along the way? Any other questions? I'm happy to be asked. Such a shame about the technical interruptions. I don't understand it. It's really, I'm, a, I'm positive. Of, oh, good. Yes, you are oh, a Karen, wonderful person. Karen, hello. <laughs> I, I didn't know you were there. Fantastic to see some names I know. How lovely. Lovely. Yes, be happy. Well being. Great. Any more questions? Hello from Ukraine. Lovely. 
Okay, I don't see any more questions. Thank you so much, Carol. You've been inspirational. Okay, thanks, and... Okay, thanks, Shia. Okay, like thanks. Thank you.